record. And here we go. So um, looking at today, unit four, lesson three, compare and contrast visuals. So this is gonna be a little familiar. We started doing something similar in language arts and we're gonna do that again today uh, where we look at you know, multiple passages. Uh, and in this case, we're gonna look at you know, multiple visuals like uh, uh, different graphs and then you know, sort of analyze what information we have on those you know, uh, two visuals, comparing them and contrasting them to come up with some you know, inferences and conclusions. Let's take a look here. Uh, what we got. So by the time you complete this lesson, you'll be able to compare visual elements by considering their similarities and contrast visual elements by considering their differences and come up with yeah, conclusions uh, as to what um, you, can, you can infer by using that information. Let's listen to our audio. When you compare two or more visual elements, you consider the similarities between them. Details about each item are used to gain insight into the other items. Once you have compared the items, you can contrast them. To contrast is to focus only on the differences. As you contrast items, you prepare yourself to analyze why the differences exist. As with other areas of the GED test, questions about comparing and contrasting visuals will test your ability to interpret information at various depth of knowledge levels through the use of complex reading skills and thinking skills. Yeah, so we've you know, seen these two words quite a bit, right? Comparing things and contrasting things. So when you compare something, you're looking for similarities between them. And when you're contrasting them, you're looking for the differences. Uh, and you could do that you know, all in one uh, uh, activity, right? You could do both of those at the same time. Uh, so let's take a look here at our <clears throat> first set of graphics and see what we got. So I'll go ahead and read the bottom here so we know, understand what revolving and non-revolving credit is. So there are two main types of credit, revolving and non-revolving. A uh, revolving credit is a line of credit with a pre-approved limit, such as a credit card. As you make charges, less credit is available to you. You can pay the balance off at any time or over time, but you also must pay finance charges on any unpaid balance. Non-revolving credit is a loan paid back on a schedule with interest, such as a car loan or a home loan. So the you know one way to think about it, right, to sort of the, the, the words that used to describe it, revolving. So it kind of goes into a, you know a circle, right? If you uh, get a credit card, use the credit card, you pay on that credit card, as long as you continue to keep that in good standing, you have that credit available to you. Uh, but, you know, you are getting charged interest and, uh, you, you know, there's other fees that may apply. Uh, with non-revolving, there is a start and a finish to it. So, you know, perfect examples whether you use are a car loan or a home loan. You know, specifically like a car loan, you go to a dealership and, uh, you know, a bank or lending institution basically gives you a sum of money to purchase that car. Uh, that, of course, they hold the title to it until you pay that off. If you, you know, default on that loan, it's, it's going to go to the bank or the lending institution. But uh, there's a start, right? You start um, with one payment. And then, you know, if it's 60 months uh, or, you know, 48 or whatever it may be, at the end of that, you're finished paying off that loan. You get your title. There's an end to that credit, that line of credit. So looking at what we have here is comparing and contrasting those two ideas over the same time frame. So revolving credit, thinking about you know, items like credit cards, uh, consumer credit from 2008 to 2012 uh, in billions of dollars, right? So credit spent in billions of dollars there, whew, that's a lot. Uh, we're up to the trillions, actually, right? When we get to that, so that's 700 billion that we start at the bottom of the y-axis, and it peaked around close to a trillion dollars, over a trillion dollars, and then we see it declining over time, and then leveling off, and a little bit of an uptick somewhere in mid 2010, right? Our x-axis shows the years 2008 to 2012. Non-revolving credit quite a different story, right? So that is like 1.5 
trillion dollars um, in non-revolving consumer credit in the year eh, back to maybe mid-2007. Talked about that time frame quite a bit, right? The uh, subprime loans, the uh, adjustable rate mortgages and stuff, that would be non-revolving credit. And we see that dropping and to 2009. So that is right there along the, um, you know, the, the financial crisis, the, the Great Recession from that time frame. And then mid-2009, we see quite a big climb from that point on with non-revolving credit, um, you know, up into 1.9-ish, it looks, trillion dollars. Uh, before we get to 2012. So our text there uh, says, when analyzing two visuals, look for similarities and differences, right? That's exactly what we're doing, comparing those two uh, types of credit. These graphs both show consumer credit, but two different types of consumer credit, right? That's what we're doing, looking at the similarities and the differences between the two. Now, Look for ways to connect the information in order to answer the question. For example, study the trends beginning in 2009 um, and decide what they both support. So that's, you know, if you're looking at a graph like that, that, that has a, a time frame involved, right, along the bottom. This, we see, you know, similarities, right? There's a little bit of a comparison in those early years from 2008 to 2000, or you know, mid 2007 to 2009. So something is happening there, right? We can, we can likely say that there's some event that is affecting both of those graphs. But why does one change more than the other, right? That's what we wanna look at and see what kind of conclusions we can draw from that. Let's take a look here then, moving over to our quiz. Unit three, less, or sorry, unit four, lesson three. Okay, let's open up the quiz here, see what we got. Okay, now let's see what it says about assumptions. So you can assume the two visuals presented together on the GED test will have a connection, right? They're not gonna have revolving credit and, um, you know, pet adoption or something like that. It's gonna be relevant, it's gonna be, you know, makes sense. So tests will have a connection. Ensure that you understand the information before trying to answer the question, right? So do the same thing we always do. Look at the title. Uh, in this case, we're going to have two different titles. Um, and then look at, you know, the, you know, the information there, what's on the y-axis, what's on the x-axis, you know, what kind of increments do they use? What values are they using in those two um, lines? And then start thinking about, you know, why they are similar and why they're different. And let's start question one here. Tracy, would you mind reading question one? Yes. Which of the following does the change beginning in 2000 and 2009 in revolving and non-revolving credits most likely indicate? A, an upswing in the economy, B, increase fear of an economic downturn, C, the beginning of a recession, D, a decrease in the amount of credit available. Into the, the economy. The, the injury, B, B. So A, actually there's an upswing. So we're looking, you know, we talked about that great recession and everything at the end of uh, Bush's uh, presidency from about 2007 through 2008. Uh, 2009, uh, President Obama takes uh, office and so usually, you know, when you see an upswing, you have people that are a little more confident, you know, so 
they're going to start looking at maybe buying a home uh, and things like that, uh, maybe a new car. So we see that turn, right? We talk about consumer confidence. That's one of the uh, economic um, measurements that we, we sometimes talk about in, in an economy uh, that goes along with like the Christmas shopping and stuff, right? Better economy, uh, it feels stronger. You feel a little more confident spending a little more. So that's what that particularly that non-revolving credit is showing. Big purchases, right? That's another way to look at revolving and non-revolving credit. Non-revolving credit usually is big purchases, cars and homes and things like that. Revolving credit is your credit card. You know, you might use for emergency purposes, or if you get like a special perk that you you know use it every month for like you know if you pay it off and stuff like that. So um, that you know indicates because we start seeing a, a little bit of a change in both. Um, that there's an uptick, there's an upswing in the economy. So one is A. Two, we have personal income and savings as a percentage of disposable income. So looking at overall, this is personal income by the billions. So this, this is, you know, looking at the U.S. economy, right, and, and, and the individual incomes uh, combined, uh, and again, huge numbers there. So that's like twelve trillion dollars we're talking about personal income, um, and we see that growing steadily, and that's broken into quarters, right? So the fiscal year is typically four quarters, and starting with quarter one, that would have been like January two thousand ten, through December 2012, a little bit of a rise as it goes along there over that time, right? And thinking again, that's past the, the, the recession of you know, 2007, 2008. Now looking at savings as a percentage of disposable personal income. So how much are these people saving? And that is a different story, right? We see more savings at the beginning there in early 2010 starts to decline some by the time we get to the end of 2010 it takes a real dip by the time we get to the end of the fourth quarter 2011 and then a little bit of an upswing and then a little more of an upswing by the time we get to the end of 2012 so you know thinking about okay income is kind of steadily increasing but but why are people not saving as much in that time frame? That's not climbing at the same rate. There's a difference there, which would indicate that they're spending more instead of saving more, right? In that uh, in that time frame between 2000, definitely 2011, around 2010 takes a dip and then it steadily declines until 2012. So what could be happening there that's causing those differences in savings versus income. So, um, Etta, would you like to read number two for us? Okay. According to the graph, there is a slow increase in income while savings as a percentage of disposable income are more vital and trending downward. Which of the following could be reasons for this trend difference. A, savings are not dependent on income. B, people always spend whatever they make. C, people are paying down debt and not saving. Or D, personal income and disposable personal income are unrelated. Um, C. So or, C, yeah, okay. C here. Um, right, so, you know, the other thing here is that we, we don't, necessarily know for sure, but we can make some inferences about, you know, what uh, is, you know, what would be the most accurate inference to make about that. And of course, by disposable income, uh, meaning, you know, uh, income that you don't have, that's not spoken for. Uh, you know, so, you know, the, that income, amount of income over your, your bills, or your, your rent, things like that. So, you know, if you want to take a, vacation or something like that, you look at, well, how much disposable income do I have? 
Um, and instead of putting that disposal, you know, that's one thing that you may need to do with it is put it into the savings. If you're not putting it into savings, then what are you using it for? And then thinking about those ideas, well, savings are not dependent on income. No, absolutely they are, right? Because how much you make depends on how much you're going to be able to save. People always spend whatever they make. Well, sometimes it feels that way, uh, and sometimes it gets us into trouble. Um, but uh, the idea is that you are, you know, using your money responsibly. You can't just make that inference by what we see here. And then, at last, with personal income and disposable, disposable personal <laughs> income are unrelated. Those are very related uh, because um, you know they 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 both come from the same pool of money, basically. All right, so moving along here, three, or I'm sorry, two, let's see, three, got a little bit of reading to do. Um, Grace, would you mind reading our passage for us on number three? Okay. Countries often specialize in goods and services depending on the resources available to them. They will most often choose to produce goods and services that provide them with a comparative advantage over other producers in a market. A country has a comparative advantage when it is better at producing a product more efficiently and cheaply than other country. To analyze comparative advantage, compare opportunity cost. The opportunity cost of producing a good or service is the value of the next best choice. For example, if country A is capable of producing four tons of wheat and one ton of corn, but decided to produce only wheat, the opportunity cost of producing one ton of wheat is one fourth ton of corn. When using comparative advantage to determine who should, produ who should produce what, a country should specialize in goods and services that have a lower opportunity cost. Opportunity cost and comparative advantage can be shown using graphs. Okay, so let's take a look at the graph then, right? So look at a country A, right? Uh, and, and on that Y axis, looking at wheat per ton. So 12 tons. Um, and then on the bottom showing the, uh, the corn, right? So much higher capability of producing wheat, right? The opportunity cost. And then uh, down below, corn. So, uh, you know, only producing four tons of corn as opposed to the 12 tons of wheat. And then country B, you see the, the opposite, right? That's the, that's the contrast. Wheat, six tons, corn, 10 tons. Uh, you know, that, that's making the, those opportunity costs, right? So like in the United States, wheat, corn, we could do both of those. Um, rubber. You know, we, you know, rubber that comes from rubber trees, right? That's a, tends to be a tropical climate. Uh, the United States, you know, doesn't have very many areas, you know, maybe Hawaii to some degree, maybe like parts of Florida, where you have the type of climate necessary to, uh, you know, plant rubber trees to, to you know, main, or, or make rubber. So that would be a bad investment. Likewise, a place like uh, Vietnam isn't going to start producing maple syrup, right? That's not a good opportunity cost for them. Rubber trees is a much better industry for them producing rubber because, you know, we know maple trees grow in a much more temperate climate, a much cooler climate like in Canada and, and sort of upper uh, Northeast of the United States. So, you know, you have to take into account what's the better production. What is, um, you know, the opportunity cost for your country? So Sasha Gay, could you read question three for us. What is the opportunity cost for country B to produce 10 tons of corn? A, two tons of wheat, B, four tons of wheat, C, six tons of wheat, and D, eight tons of wheat. Six tons. There you go. Yeah, right on it. So we're looking at country B, right? Those two lines. Where do they? Where do they? What? What line does it draw? So if we're looking at corn, it 
you know, cost the same to produce 10 tons of corn as it would only six tons of wheat, right? That's the opportunity cost there. <laughs> so you're producing a heck of a lot more corn than you are wheat. Vice versa, the opportunity cost for country A, they're producing only four tons of corn per 12 tons of wheat. So the opportunity cost to produce wheat is much greater. Okay, so three is C, six tons of wheat. And so our same passage for three, um, Nakia, would you mind reading question four? If you're there, if you're available. All right, we'll try to come back to you. How about Christiana? Did you read question four for us? Um, okay. If each country specialized to the benefit of both countries, which of the following best describes what each country should produce and why. A, country A should produce corn and country B should produce <coughs> wheat because country A has the highest opportunity cost for wheat and country B has the highest opportunity cost for corn. B, country A should produce corn and country B should produce wheat because country A has the lowest opportunity cost of, for wheat and country B has the lowest oppo opportunity cost for corn. C, country A should produce wheat and country B should produce corn because country A has the highest opportunity cost for wheat and country B has the highest opportunity corn for corn. CMD. Country A should produce wheat and country B should produce corn because country A has the lowest opportunity cost for wheat and country B has the lowest opportunity cost for corn. Uh, mm, is it A? It's D. You want the lowest opportunity cost for the product you're producing. So country A, the lower opportunity cost is to produce wheat, right? Because they can produce more wheat for the same amount of money that they can four tons of corn, right? So 14 or 12 for wheat, four for corn. Lower opportunity cost there. Uh, that's the way I think about it. Why, what can I produce more of for the same money? That's opportunity cost. So for that country, it's wheat. So D as dog for four. And the quiz is complete. Um, real quick there. So one was A. Two was C. Three was also C. And four was D. Okay. So let's go on over to the workbook here. And so, as it says, to compare and contrast is a useful way to make connections between two or more items and the ideas they represent, right? We've been dealing with comparing and contrasting. Compares Similarities, contrasting, looking at differences. So to compare items is to examine the similarities and differences between them. To contrast them is to consider only the differences. Once you're familiar with the similarities and differences, you can analyze what these similarities and differences tell you about the items, right? Thinking critically then about those comparison, you know, those, the, the contrast and comparison of those two. When you compare and contrast visuals, first take note of the things that are alike from there, examine the things that are distinctive to each one. And a lot of times you kind of do that simultaneously, you know, uh, like I mentioned, when, you, when you're writing about comparing and contrasting, a lot of times, you know, comparing something, you're eliminating what is, what is different. And, and so you're, 
looking at that, coming back to it, and, and that information is already there for you. So here, right, we're looking at minimum wage, the federal hourly minimum wage uh, over time on our graph on the left with our, with our dollar bill there, George Washington. Um, <clears throat> 1938 was the Fair, Fair Labor Act, I believe, that um, where a, a, a federal minimum wage was included. Uh, remember the Great Depression era, um, some of that uh, legislation and, and um, the agenda of Roosevelt. He had actually tried to pass a federal minimum wage in 1933, and the Supreme Court said that it was unconstitutional. Um, and then came back about five years later and successfully passed a federal minimum wage for 25 cents per hour. Um, then we see how it climbed. In 1968, it was $1.60. Um, over 40 years, climbed from $1.60 to $6.55. And then the new uh, minimum wage, I guess it is, I don't know if we've, I think, is it still 725? I think it's still 725 for the federal minimum wage. Um, and then our chart, our table on the right. So we have states and then uh, the basic minimum wage per hour. So uh, federal, um, you know, mandates a, a federal minimum wage. States, however, can have their own minimum wage. Uh, Georgia, 2012, had 5.15 per hour. California, $8 per hour. Washington, D.C., 8.25 per hour. Florida, 7.79 per hour. And Massachusetts, $8 per hour. So we look under here at our information. It says the graph displays an upward trend in the amount of the U.S. minimum wage. Keep in mind that the last three years shown cover one to three year gaps. Uh, while the first three years cover 30 and 40 year gaps. So always make sure that you look at, you know, the, the values that's on a graph, right? Make sure, you know, you could very easily um, not, you know, th that's an indicator right there is that huge jump. Why are we seeing a huge jump there between $1.60 and $6.55? And then you, you realize, okay, that's 40 years. So a uh, big difference there. And then we see it climb just over the course of, of four years. Table B, uh, the table contains information that can be compared and contrasted between states in the table and the information presented on the graph. So we can start even com making comparison contrasting there. Why is Georgia's minimum wage per hour so much different than California's or Washington DC's or Florida's? Why are those similar? Um, and also comparing that to the federal minimum wage. So why is Washington DC's minimum wage a dollar more per hour? Let's take a look at the workbook here and see what we'll get into here. So again, it says, uh, although the federal government sets a minimum wage standard, some states may set lower standards for particular types of jobs not covered by the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act. So you know, it's well, those sort of complicated um, labor laws, uh, you know, things like servers make a much lower minimum wage because they uh, make up for that in gratuities, right? In tips. So I think it's $2 and something per hour as a server. Uh, and then your, your tips are, are supposed to what make up the difference in the, in the minimum wage gap there. So um, number one, We'll go back to Tracy. Would you mind reading question one for us? Yes. Number one, which of the following can you infer uh, by comparing and contrasting mm -hmm. information under two visuals? A, business ventures at fat minimum wage. B, uh, much at... Um, B in Massachusetts. Massachusetts enacted the first medium wage law. C, uh, Georgia has a lower cost of living than the other states. D, increasing the federal minimum wage creates new jobs. Uh, 
um, C? Yeah, right. You can make that inference. And it's just an inference, right? We would want to explore that more before we actually drew a conclusion about that. We could have another graph, and I'm sure they're out there about uh, um, cost of living, right? Where you have all the states on there and you can see that over time. Uh, so Georgia, and you can even, you know, you can make that assumption if you, you know, with some, with some previous knowledge about, um, you know, cost of living per state. Um, I spent a couple of summers in California working in 2015, 2016, and I lived walking distance from downtown Los Angeles. I could walk to like Staples Center and stuff. And I paid $800 for a room and a house. Uh, I sublet a room and it was a decent neighborhood. It was a safe neighborhood, nothing to write home about, you know, real sort of middle class, um, even kind of lower middle class college. It was close to USC. $800 for a room with a shared kitchen and a shared bathroom. And that was more than the rent that I paid in Athens for our two bedroom um, apartment. <laughs> it tells you something about, you know, the people uh, living in, in Los Angeles I hear a lot about places like Los Angeles and DC and the cost of living. Um, <clears throat> I've looked at jobs in DC and you think, wow, <clears throat> you know, working for the government in DC, you make a lot of money. Um, and half of that's going to go back out and rent, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy. So yeah, but you could definitely draw that conclusion or make that inference, make an inference, not necessarily a conclusion that there's a, a lower cost of living in Georgia based on their state minimum wage. So one is C. Etta, would you mind reading number two? Okay. And which of the following ways do the minimum wages in California and Massachusetts compare to the federal minimum wage? A, theirs are lower than the federal minimum wage. B, theirs are higher than the federal minimum wage. C, theirs are equal to the federal minimum wage. Or D, California's minimum wage is lower than the federal minimum wage, while Massachusetts minimum wage is higher than the federal minimum wage. Okay, so I know it's not D. Okay, California and Massachusetts are the same. Uh, C? It's, it's B. So they are higher than the federal minimum wage, right? Um, so going back to our graph, right? 2009, 2012, uh, 725, California, eight, Massachusetts, eight. So about 75 cents on uh, more than that federal minimum wage. So B is a boy for two. And another Grant, well, two graphs. Uh, unemployment rate, 2012. See the percentage <clears throat> by level of education. So less than the high school diploma, the unemployment rate, high school diploma, yada, 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 right? We see uh, you, you're, you're really good until you get back to a, a PhD. <laughs> you keep dropping until you get to that doctorate. And then <laughs> the unemployment rate goes back up. Uh, so, you know, stay away from that PhD in philosophy, uh, you know. So uh, the median weekly earnings in 2012. So uh, on, on the opposite side, right? Uh, how much per week does each of those individuals make, you know, on average based on their level of degree? Um, again, stay away from the PhD because you learn to make more uh, with a professional degree as a, a like a lawyer. Right. That's a, a Juris Doctor, which is a, a professional degree, or I think uh, MDs, a medical doctor, is also considered a professional degree. Um, and then there's others, too. So a master's degree, right? Big jump between master's and bachelor's, uh, decent jump between bachelor's and associates, right, on down until less than diploma. So $471 is about the median weekly earnings for a person less than a high school diploma in 2012. Right. And we also see the highest level of unemployment um, 
at 12.4, right? So we see that comparison, right? There's, there's a comparison to, to make there between uh, the, the income earned and, and the unemployment rate. And then we also see, um, what is that line there? Okay, all workers. So that's an, what they're saying there, if we combine that dotted line. So the unemployment rate for all categories combined in 2012 was 6.8%. Likewise, the average of all professions and all degrees uh, was $815, right? Then we see those individual, uh, the breakout for each level of education. So let's take a look here. Grace, would you mind reading question three? All right. In which of the following ways are median weekly earnings and unemployment related to each other? A, the higher the median weekly earnings, the lower the rate of unemployment. B, the lower the rate of unemployment, the lower the median weekly earnings. C, the higher the median weekly earnings, the higher the rate of unemployment. And D, the higher the degree level, the lower both the unemployment rate and median weekly income. Oh. A. D, I'm sorry, wait, four, three, yeah, A, 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 A. Uh, yeah, the higher the median weekly earnings, the lower the rate of unemployment, um, right? Dad. Until you get to the doctorate. <laughs> but, but everything, it's a great indicator, right? You know, the, the more opportunity for jobs uh, as, your, as your degree level goes up, as well as the wage. Those are, you know, correspond pretty closely, right? So three is A. And four, we got the same graph here. So Sasha Gay, how about reading number four? Based on the graphs, which of the following is most likely true of a person with a bachelor's degree? A, the person is unlikely to find a job and earn less than 1300 per week. B, the person is likely to find a job and earn about $1,700 per week. C, the person is unlikely to find a job and will not earn more than $750 per week. D, the person is likely to find a job and earn about $1,000 per week. Is it D? Yeah, it's D. D is a dog. All right, so looking at... Uh... So you know we can we can zero right in on that level. So we just we just go right up here to bachelor's degree. We look at that, right? So definitely the the uh, level of employment, right? The unemployment rate drops, and then yeah, we're likely to earn just about over a thousand dollars, right? About thousand dollars sixty six per week with that bachelor's degree. So four is D as in dog, five our same graph, number five, Nakia. How about number five for us? No problem. Number five, which of the following occupations will fall into both of the categories? Second lowest rate of unemployment, unemployment and second highest medium weekly earnings. So the professional degree makes the highest weekly earnings and Which of the following occupations will fall into the categories second lowest rate of unemployment and second highest? A is fast food worker, B is college professor, C is teacher's A, and D is licensed electrician. Category second lowest rate. and highest median weekly earnings. So a fast food worker can not have a diploma or anything. You don't have to have that to go 
and then be a college professor, you have to have um, a degree. Teacher's aid is like when you're in college. I have no clue. I have no clue, Matt. <laughs> so you, it's a little bit complicated, right? Um, so I mean, I'm trying to assess them because I know which each one kind of would have to have to on the list, you know, bachelor's professional and all of that, but. Yeah, they kind of throw you for a loop because you're having to think about an extra kind of level of information, right? If they yeah. just put like the degree on there, it's a little bit easier to to sort of associate. Um, but it's so what we're looking at is that doctoral degree. So if we go up here to the top, right, it's the second lowest rate of unemployment, right? So that professional degree is the lowest with 2.1. And then when you get back up to the doctoral degree, the level of unemployment increases uh, uh, just a, a snip there by about uh, four tenths of a percent. Oh, it'll be be a college professor? Yeah, it's the college professor. Uh, so yeah, so that's the second lowest rate and it's the second highest earnings. So the highest earnings being that professional degree, right? Lawyers and stuff like that, yeah. earning the most lowest employment rate or unemployment rate, sorry, unemployment rate. Then you get to that and uh, yeah, uh, can understand that because getting a tenured track job at a university is uh, is not uh, easy. <laughs> so I can I know why doctorates uh, sometimes are unemployed. So yeah, five for B B is a boy there, and then six. Um, Christiana, how about reading question six for us? Christiana, you there? Um, yes, I'm here. <laughs> no, <more. laughs> oh my God. Okay, a woman make, makes the individual choice not to complete college and instead to begin working. To begin working, what can you conclude about his about this woman? A her chance of finding a well paying job are much better than the chance of a person with a bachelor's degree. B, she will be, she will be unable to find a good, she'll be unable to find a job easily where she makes a median weekly income of more than $500. Um, C, she will make more money and more easily she will make more money and more easily found more, more easily found a job than a person who has not completed high school. Um, the, her income is more likely to be above average than the income of a person with a professional de degree. Um, C? Yeah, C. X is C. And, you know, you make that inference there that if they've completed that they're leaving college, that they completed a high school diploma. So that means that they're in that second bracket there. Um, so 8.3 unemployment or so, 652 uh, median uh, weekly income. So six is C. And then a little text here. So every adult with financial history in the United States has a credit score. Your score is calculated using several different pieces of credit data. The types of credit accounts you have, how long you've had an account, and your payment and balance history. Making late payments and carrying a high balance have a negative impact on your score. Uh, paying off the balance every month on time has a positive impact. Um, so looking at uh, first the, the pie chart there, <laughs> right? What makes up your credit score? We have payment history, debt, uh, you know, your debt load, length of uh, credit history, new credit and types of credit used. And um, then, you know, do you know your credit score? So the idea of, uh, you know, poor scores under 580 or so, um, then 580 to 620 is a poor score, 620 to 680 is a fair score, 680 to 720 is good. Anything over 720 is excellent. Um, so that's, you know, 
two comparable items. So you can think about, you know, why would somebody have an excellent credit score? Um, well, they have a good, you know, long payment history where they, where they make their, you know, credit card payments and all that stuff on time. Uh, debt, they have a manageable amount of debt, um, you know, that makes them a, uh, a good prospect for more lending, right? You're not above your head in a bunch of credit card debt or car loan and stuff like that. Length of credit history, right? If you're a, you know, 18, 19 year old, you're first out on your own, it's hard to get credit. Um, you know, or, you know, you're, if you get a new car or something like that, you might be paying outrageous amount for your, for your percentage rate on your loan. Uh, and, you know, new credit, <clears throat> if you, you know, suddenly, you know, get, you know, a new credit card and a loan and this and that, uh, that's going to make your credit score dip because that's a little, you know, a little bit of a concern for lenders and stuff. If all of a sudden you're getting out there and you're getting a bunch of new credit uh, and then types of credit used. Or the same thing, you know, do you have a mortgage, uh, right? That non-revolving versus revolving credit comes into play. Uh, you know, how many car loans do you have in your household? How many credit cards do you have? Uh, may also make you more of a risk, even if you do keep that, you know, manage your payment history and stuff. A, a lending agency is going to take that into account. That's going to affect your credit score if you, you know, have a lot of different types of credit that you are using. So <clears throat> looking at our question then, Tracy, would you like to read number seven? Yes. In which of the following credit score ranges is a person who is consistently late in making mortgage payments, credit card payments, and student loan and payments, and carries a high balance on each of these, most likely to be? A, 400 to 550, B, 550 to 600, C, 700 to 750, D, 800 to 850. Uh, So a little help there. The lower the credit score, the worse your credit is, right? The low, the lower credit card. Uh, how how we know this? <laughs> Because I don't see the, the number. So um, it's A, right? So 400 to 450, um, you know, they show you on the graph that range. So 580, anything below 580 is very poor score. So that graph could continue on down, right? Into the 400s and it can go up above 720. So, you know, the example they're using uh, late in making your mortgage payment or credit card payments or student loan payments, right? And you carry a high balance on each of these. So if I'm only paying the bare minimum for, you know, my credit card, like the minimum um, of the, the, you know, the minimum just to keep, you know, my credit card from being uh, 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 going into uh, default or my credit company just, you know, sending my uh, my uh, payments off and to a collection agency. So all of that would, you know, drop your credit score. If you're making your payments on time and say you just have like a car loan, maybe one credit card, uh, then you're probably likely to have a much higher credit score, right? You're gonna have, you know, a, a lending company, a new credit card agency, whatever it may be, they're gonna look at you know, and say, they're a good bet. Right. I, I'll go ahead and I'll I'll give them this line of credit because they're likely to repay it. Uh, so yeah, A for number seven. That's a low credit score. I think my credit score is probably about fifty right now. Um, actually, my credit's okay. So <laughs> eight. Um, let's go with Etta. How about you take number eight for us? Okay. It says which of the following actions 
will most significantly improve a person's credit score? A, taking out a home mortgage, B, adding a new credit card, C, taking out a new car loan, or D, paying down balances on credit cards? Um, D? D, yeah, paying down balances on credit cards, right? So anything to reduce your credit, <laughs> or I mean, reduce your, your debt load. Uh, it's going to help improve your credit score. So taking care of those credit card payments, take, you know, if you pay off a car, that's great. That means you, you've reduced that line of, of credit. Um, so you have more available credit uh, issued, uh, stuff like that, right? Any dispute responsible with your bills and your credit is going to improve your credit score. Um, there's also, you know, you'll, you'll hear, there's a lot of ads, you know, for like these different um, uh, apps where you could check your credit history and stuff. And I'll say that that might affect your, your credit history. Um, short term, a lot of times, you know, if, if you're, if someone is checking your credit, that also there's an assumption there that you are looking for new credit and that may affect your credit score short term. Like all of a sudden, you know, you're going for a car loan and your credit score has dipped because, you know, you've been searching around for, for a, a new loan. Um, and that can affect it for a, a while too. So D as a dog, right? Keeping those balances on your credit cards paid down is gonna help your credit score. And now some new information again. So four important statistics used to analyze data sets and visuals, mean, median, mode, and range. And I'll make sure we get definitions of these in uh, uh, Google Classroom. Uh, so you can reference them later. So mean is the average, right? We just talked about mean up here in our graph, right? The mean, or no, that was median, sorry. Um, mean is an average when you, you know, put together a set of numbers and then you um, are looking for an average of those numbers. So to find the mean, you add up all the numbers and divide the sum by how many numbers are in the data set. <clears throat> your average, you know, your uh, test scores and things like that your you know, grades and things like that in school, those are, are average, right? Median, on the other hand, is the middle value of a set data. So to find the median, all right, you list all the numbers from, from least to greatest. And yeah, I imagine you probably, guys will probably cover this in, in math at some point or maybe in science. So the median we is- We already did. Yeah, <laughs> so I figured you guys have come across this. Uh, yeah. So it's the number in the middle. Mode is the number that occurs the most often. Uh, and range is the difference between the largest and the smallest value, right? So annual growth and real GDP, right? Gross domestic product we've talked about. Um, and so we have blue GDP, yellow is private services producing sector, and green is private goods, private services producing sector, private goods producing sector. So services, right? Your service industry, as opposed to your product producing industry. So your goods producing sector is in green, your services are in yellow, and then GDP is in blue. So looking at the annual growth in real GDP over, what do we have here? Okay, so um, by quarter there, quarter one, two, and three. All right, so looking here between, actually let's go with Grace. How about reading number nine? Okay. Between the years 2009 and 2012, what was the mode and the range of the percent of annual growth in the private service producing sector uh, okay so the mode is 2.4 and then the range this and that. The, the range is six so b so yeah, uh, B for number nine, right? So the mode was 2.4, we see that, uh, you're right, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4. So we see that most often, 
That's the one that occur, occurs most often. And then uh, the range is about 6%. So we're looking at right uh, down here, negative 6% up to, well, five at the top. So 6% there, B as in boy for nine. All right. And well, that's the only one we had for the bar graph. So uh, again, you looking at that real quick, right? The, the, the growth, 2009, end of that great recession. So we see we're, we're, we took a hit as far as growth. we didn't grow, we retracted, right? We, we shrank as far as GDP growth and, and, and goods and services produced. Uh, and then 2010, we got back on track where that was up 2.4, 2.7, 2.9, and so forth, right? So we had growth in 2012, 2010, 2011, 2012. So, you know, thinking about that sort of um, uh, prior knowledge too, when we're talk talking about the early 2000s and the late uh, going into the 20, 2010s, you know, that great recession and how that impacted the economy. Growth pay, amount of pay before deductions, and what a, you know, your paycheck may look like over here. Um, so gross pay in our column, you know, prepaid deductions, after-tax deductions, federal withholding tax, state tax, local tax, your FICA, your 401k, and your net pay, right? So way down at the bottom after everything else removed, you get your net pay. Uh, so pre-tax deductions. So uh, uh, explanation there, Deductions taken out before taxes, they are not themselves taxed. So um, like uh, uh, savings, like a 401k, that's pre-tax deduction. So if you are you know, in your job, they offer you a 401k and you put in so much per paycheck, that is taken out untaxed. Um, so you know, say you're making like right over here, right? You gross $2,000. So that is your paycheck for two weeks, uh, whatever it may be. Um, before they start taking out taxes or anything, let's say you put $100 per paycheck into your 401k, then that is untaxed and it goes in and the 1900s left. After tax deductions, taken out after taxes, they are taxed the same percentage as the gross pay. So um, they are, uh, yeah, tax the same percentage as the gross pay. Deduction put toward federal income tax, right? Federal withholding deduction. So that's a deduction put toward federal income tax obligation. State tax, right? Then you have your deduction put towards state income tax. We all pay state taxes as well. Local taxes, uh, depending on the rate, right? Deduction towards local income. FICA, that's, we talked about that, right? Social Security tax, the Federal Insurance Compensation Act, uh, that's also like Medicare, right? So that's taken out. 401k, so voluntary deduction requested by worker to go into a retirement fund. So some of those are pre-tax, some of those are after tax. Net pay, amount given to worker after deductions. So when it's all said and done, after everything is taken out, right? That's the difference between gross and net. Gross is everything that you made per hour. Net is what's going to be in that paycheck that you know hits your bank account if you got direct deposit or the check that they hand you at the end of your you know pay period. Uh, that's actually what you cleared. So, and then we see each one of those um, taxable elements in there. So the federal withholding 500, right? You, it's tax time. People are filing out filing their taxes. So, you know, depending on how much is taken out, then you may, you know, whatever your other deductions are and yada, 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 then you may get uh, uh, taxes or your, you may get a refund check from the government. That's where that comes from, the federal withholding. FICA, it's that social security tax, basically. Then a state tax, whatever the rate is for your state and local tax, you know, if you live in Dublin or, uh, you know, Columbus, wherever, uh, the uh, local taxes are taken out. And then there may be others depending on where you live, like school taxes and so forth and so on. So looking at number 10, uh, Sasha Gay, would you like to read number 10 for us? Which of the following can you infer about 401k from looking at the tax table and pay stub? A, 401k money never come out of a person's paycheck 
B, not everyone has 401k monies removed from his or her paycheck. C, the government randomly removes 401k monies from an individual's paycheck. And D, 401k monies are part of federal withholdings. B? Yeah, right. You may opt out of that if your if you're, you know, place of government has a uh, some type of retirement plan or something like that. The B as a boy, and that's a comparison from, from the right to the left, right? What's taken out on that side? Federal withholding, FICA, state, local. We don't see a 401k. Tiers difference then, so not everyone. We can confirm that not everyone has 401k money removed from their paycheck. Ten is B as a boy, and eleven. How about back to Nakia? Would you like to take eleven for us? Did you say me, Matt? Yeah, would you mind reading 11? Which of the following conclusions can be drawn from comparing and contrasting the same pages in the pay stuff? Hey, hey guys, please be quiet. A, net pay is the smallest amount that will appear on your pay stub. B, paying federal, state, and local taxes is an individual is individual is an individual choice. C, the table provides information to an employee to an employee, while the pay stub provides information to the employer. D, gross pay is the largest amount of pay that will pay that will appear on a pay stub, and I think the answer is B. Yeah, it's D, right? It's the gross pay. So that's the amount you look at every week or two weeks whenever you get paid, and you're like, that's what I actually earned, as opposed to what I brought home. You're like, man, it'd be nice to actually get the gross pay. Um, so yeah, 11 is D, right? That's going to always be the highest number on there. Uh, looking at that again, right? 2000. And then by the time we get to our net pay after taxes are taken out, you know, we're taking a whole like 1200. Uh, so sad day. Um, so yeah, 11 is D. And then um, Christiana, how about reading 12? Number 12, which of the following economic institution is most, is most closely involved with the data and information found in the table and on the system? A, the World Bank Group, B, the National the National Bureau of Economic Research, C, um, the United States Federal Reserve, D, the International Internal Revenue Service. So, wait, if you don't pay your taxes, who do you get in trouble with? The IRS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's D, right? The IRS. So, you know, if you go to a new job and you fill out those tax forms and everything, that's usually has, you know, internal revenue service at the top. Um, yeah, so they handle basically all of that. That's, you know, the revenue, right? So the collection of, of money. So they're responsible for collecting those taxes. They're, you know, responsible for collecting the, the revenue for the federal government. So D, Internal Revenue Service for 12. That's where that federal withholding and FICA, they deal with all of that. D is in dog for 12. And um, let's see, back to Tracy for our last one there, 13. I think the federal government may institute a stimulative fiscal policy when it wants to st stimulate economic growth. Most of the following changes is the person whose paid stop is shown most likely to see if the federal government makes changes to stimulate economic growth. A 
a decrease in the amount of the federal withholding <laughs> increasing in the amount of state tax withheld see a degree in the number of free tax deduction see the degree of the his or her cross pay the D. So it's A. So if they, um, <clears throat> the federal government is trying to uh, stimulate the economy, they may drop that federal income tax uh, to give you, you know, more money to put back into the economy. So yeah, A, decrease the federal withholding. Uh, they wouldn't be able to do anything with states because that's, you know, state decision, uh, state tax or state decision. Decrease the number of pre-tax deductions. No, because those are pre-tax. The uh, federal government doesn't really have anything to do with that. And a decrease in his or her gross pay, well, that would also negatively affect the economy because you're actually reducing their overall income. So A there. Uh, more likely, they'll put out a stimulus check rather than dropping the actual rate of, of taxes. Um, so 13 is A. And that is the workbook. Any follow-up there for any of those questions? Everybody get those answers. Miss, can I get number five? Number five was B, B as in boy. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. Um, so yeah, this is, you know, fairly straightforward. Uh, we're gonna do this uh, with text in, in language arts today. Um, and it's 